Hi, everyone. Judge Andrew Napolitano here for Judging Freedom. Today is Thursday, April 18th, 2024. Max Blumenthal joins us now. Max, my dear friend, it's a pleasure. Thank you for coming back onto the show. Do you, uh, from your sources, um, are you able to tell if the Israelis recognize or admit publicly that Hamas still stands and the overwhelming majority of the Israeli hostages are still confined. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's why Netanyahu is pushing so hard for this Rafa invasion. And there was just a report in Al Arabi Al Jadid, which is a Qatari publication citing Egyptian officials on background that the Biden administration has arranged some kind of trade off with Israel in which it will be allowed a limited assault on Rafah in, in the southern Gaza Strip in exchange for not directly attacking Iran. Mm. Now, I have, no <laughs> I have no idea if that's true, that the Biden administration is trading Palestinian blood to avoid a all-out or, or an, you know, a, a further escalation between Israel and Iran which would probably trigger something like 1,500 Iranian ballistic missiles over the course of three days. Um, I have no idea if that's true, but it speaks to the complete failure of the Israeli military in Gaza, where Netanyahu is saying he can't finish the job and they can't march towards victory unless they take out four battalions, which are currently stationed in Rafah, belonging to Hamas alone. So Netanyahu admits that after six months, of unrelenting genocide they've failed and they need to go into rafa where there are like still a million refugees holding out and it will be a complete bloodbath a week ago the biden administration said they were against it but the calculus may have changed here's what we were discussing before we came on air uh max matt lee the associated press reporter trying to get a straight answer at a Vidant Patel, and you have some other information about this guy's duplicity, but here's um, Mr. Lee patiently until the end going after Patel. Can you clear up uh, either to kill or keep alive these persistent reports that, that you guys have told the Israelis that you're okay with them going ahead with the Rafa operation as long as they don't attack Iran? So we've been uh, pretty clear, uh, Matt, that uh, any kind of operation into Rafa uh, requires some uh, pretty serious planning because of the uh, three main components that you've heard me, Matt, the secretary, outline um, pretty seriously before. Uh, okay, that's an excellent answer to a question that I don't think I asked. I asked you whether or not the U.S. has told the Israelis that you're okay with a uh, Rafa operation as long as they limit or don't attack Iran in response to what happened over the weekend. So, Matt, I don't want to, the, 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 the devil is in the details here. It would require what kind of operation in Tarafa we're talking about. If you... All right, so regardless of whether Israel does anything with in response to the Iranian attack over the weekend, you still would oppose a Rafa operation unless what you just mentioned are, so, why can't you just say no, that it is not true that you have told It's them. not true. It's not true. But I'm well, why speaking... Why could you have just I, said it, that at not, the beginning instead of going on for... Because you... I, I, I thought the question I'm was try, pretty clear. It wasn't that clear. I'm trying to be specific. <laughs> this is what you go through on a daily basis when you're there? <laughs> well, Vedant doesn't give me follow-ups because I'm not in the, the bullpen with the, you know... AP and credentialed people. Was he being uh, truthful? Do you know if there is this agreement? Has Joe Biden suddenly decided that it's okay for Bibi Netanyahu to slaughter a half a million women and God knows how many children in Rafa? Well, I mean, another question is, does Netanyahu even care what Biden thinks? And, you know, mm -hmm. is the dog wagging its own tail? Can Biden even control Netanyahu? What leverage is he willing to use? They're still... They're still shipping the weapons. They're still giving Netanyahu uh, to like right now or in like an hour, they're going to destroy the Palestinian Authority's latest attempt for statehood at the UN. So they're still giving Israel total diplomatic cover. So we, what, what, 
what are they going to allow Israel to do or what will Netanyahu do? Actually, Netanyahu gave a statement in Hebrew only about 24 hours ago, stating that he would make decisions completely autonomously from the U.S. and that he would seek to return settlements to the Gaza Strip. He said that they, the Palestinians thought they would surround us. Well, now we're going to build settlements and we'll surround them. So obviously he doesn't care what Biden thinks anyway, but what would it mean for a kind of Israeli incursion into Rafah? What does Israel want to do? They actually not only want to destroy four Hamas battalions in an area that's one of, that is currently the most densely populated area on earth. There are just tents everywhere. People have, who have nowhere else to go have filled up this area and they'll have nowhere to hide. But they also want to create a buffer zone in what they call the Philadelphia Corridor, which is between Rafa and the Egyptian Sinai Desert and the Egyptian side of Rafa. And Israel started this whole propaganda blitz, which you'll see in Israeli media, about how Egypt has failed to destroy the smuggling tunnels uh, into Gaza. And this is why October 7th happened. They're starting to point the finger at Egypt. And Egypt's saying, you can't do that because it violates all of our security agreements under the rubric of Camp David. And Camp David is really the linchpin of American hegemony in that region of the Middle East. It removed Egypt as the real base of Arab nationalism and Arab resistance. And now Egypt is threatening to shred that security agreement if Israel comes in, starts massacring Palestinians, creates a buffer zone basically on or in its own territory, and then Palestinians start flooding into Egypt as refugees. So the Biden administration is so badly mismanaged this crisis that they are threatening to undermine one of the central foundations of American control in the Middle East. And we haven't even talked about Iran yet. Right. We're, we will get to Iran. Just briefly, what is the Philadelphia Corridor? Is that in Egypt or is that in Israel? It's in the southern Gaza Strip, and it's the area where there have been tunnels Israel has always run bulldozers through there and sought to control it to seal off Gaza Strip from the Arab world. Um, it's, it, if, I don't know if you remember Rachel Corey, for example, being run over by an Israeli I bulldozer. Do, I do remember that. Is that where it happened? Yeah, she was uh, trying to stand in the way of a family's home. She had been close to the patriarch of that family who was a local physician and a bulldozer. And the bulldozer was trying to destroy all these homes in the Philadelphia corridor. So this would be the most severe Israeli assault on that area. And when they when they create a buffer zone, they're just going to bring in tons of explosives and blow up mm -hmm. civilian neighborhoods and then occupy the area. And they're going to be right on the Egyptian border, which is unacceptable to Egypt. There it is. Thank you, uh, Chris. Uh, are Gazans uh, returning to... I want to get back to this theme that you articulated the other day, I think on the gray zone, or it may have been on one of your posts, uh, that Haaretz and even the Wall Street Journal have recognized that Israel has failed uh, to defeat Hamas. And I think one of the things you said was Gazans are returning to northern Gaza and some businesses, particularly food businesses, notably bakeries, are back and operating. Is that yeah. true? Oh, absolutely. And so this speaks to the failure of Israel, not just militarily, but Israel had wanted to create this giant buffer zone around northern Gaza to make it uninhabitable, to thin out the population. But Palestinians over the course of 75 years of ethnic cleansing have adopted this cultural uh, ethos that they call sumud or steadfastness. It's a word every Palestinian knows, and they, it basically means that if we hold our ground, remain as resilient as possible in the face of Israeli attacks, our society will prove stronger than theirs because they're settler colonists and we are the people of the land. So all we have to do is hold fast. And it was something I saw when I first came into the Gaza Strip in 2014. I went to this area Israel had destroyed east of Gaza City during that 51-day uh, assault that year called Shujaia. And I was seeing families just sitting in their living rooms, but their living room was just an as assembly of chairs in a destroyed building. And mm -hmm. they said, this is where we live. 
I worked my whole life to build this house and I'm going to stay here. And so now Palestinians are coming back from Rafah to northern Gaza because the Israeli military has been forced to withdraw from there. And they're going to the ruins of their homes and they're just going to sit there, put plastic sheets over their homes and say, this is our land and you can't you can't just move us. This is a major defeat and bakeries are beginning to get flour again. I think the problem for the local population there is while there is some food there, now no one has any money. Um, there's no economy and Israel's going to do everything it can to keep it that way. That's why Israel's been assaulting Al Shifa hospital too, is it sustains life there. That's why they've blown up all the schools and the universities. They don't want people to have anything to come back to, but they don't, they underestimate the Palestinian spirit. Um, and I think that's what will contribute to the defeat that was proclaimed in Haaretz by this columnist Haim Levinson, who has been a major supporter early on of Israel's military operation in Gaza. I mean, it's a liberal paper. They're against Netanyahu. But this guy isn't some dove. And he declared uh, just last week, total defeat for Israel in the Gaza Strip. Total defeat. The Wall Street Journal put it more softly. Uh, Israel is on the brink of defeat in Gaza. You know, the Wall Street Journal had an interesting piece I thought of you when I was reading it. I, I believe it was yesterday's uh, talking about the bitter rivalry between uh, Gallant, Netanyahu, uh, and Gantz that they don't even speak with each other except when they're in the group of the uh, of the war cabinet. Is this deleterious to, is, to Netanyahu's uh, government? Is it the beginning of the end? of Netanyahu's government, or is it just vanity? Well, I mean, this is just, I, I think this is par for the course, but it does speak to the instability of Israeli politics. Uh, it's an instability that the Americans are seeking to exploit. Uh, the protests leading up to October 7th had influence from the Biden administration. I don't think there's any question about that. Benny Gantz is the person the Biden administration would like to see in place of Netanyahu, they welcomed him to Washington, which infuriated Netanyahu. I mean, he did get a little dressing down, but they didn't do anything to him. And Netanyahu has made repeated decisions, including decisions about negotiations in Doha over the objections of or without the approval of other members of his war cabinet, basically violating the rules. So Israeli politics are very unstable now. And this coalition that Netanyahu has, I mean, the fanatics, Ben Gvir, the security minister, who is from the most fanatical faction of the settler religious nationalist movement in the West Bank, Smotrich, they got Netanyahu by the short and curlies, which is why Netanyahu is promising to build settlements in the Gaza Strip, which is just uh, seems untenable and absolutely insane. It's sort of a sop to keep them from bolting from his coalition. I mean, they're also demanding a massive strike on Iran. And then you have people like Gabi Ashkenazi, the former chief of staff of the Israeli military, who comes from Netanyahu's left. Immediately after Iran's counterattack, it was Ashkenazi who was pushing for a direct attack on Iran. This is something a lot of people don't recognize outside mm -hmm. observers, is Netanyahu is not always the most hawkish and might even be more cautious than the militarists who are supposedly to his left, who are more favored by the Americans. It's a head scratcher. Uh, Max, didn't Iran uh, on Saturday night penetrate Israel's most securely guarded and supported military base? Yeah, this is the uh, Nevatim base in the Negev Desert. That was the target, unlike Israel, which targets schools, family homes, and just entire neighborhoods. They were targeting a base in the Negev yeah, or consulates, sure. Uh, unprecedented attacks on consulates. They were targeting a military base that houses, or uh, it's an air base. It's where the F-35s are, the most prized platform in Israel's arsenal, which is, you know, comes straight from the U.S. And it's therefore heavily defended by billions of dollars of worth of anti-aircraft systems, David Sling, the Arrow system, and of course the Iron Dome. And these cost a lot to replenish. So they managed to penetrate. They managed to hit the base. Israel has acknowledged some superficial damage, but
but it's really deep psychological damage to the Israeli psyche that Iran was able to do that supposedly without using hypersonic missiles or without using the kind of ballistic missiles that are the most advanced in its arsenal. Uh, Israel was jamming its GPS in the days ahead of this planned attack, and the ballistic missiles turned out to not even rely on GPS to hit their targets. And today we saw in Ma'ariv, a mainstream Israeli newspaper, that Israel had claimed that it took down 99% of Iran's ballistic missiles, but the real number was more like 84%. I think it's actually lower, but we have also heard from Ronan Bergman, security correspondent for Ynet, another mainstream Israeli publication, as well as the New York Times, that the discussions, the private discussions in the Israeli war cabinet during the Iranian attack grew so panicked that if the Israeli public had heard them, four million people would have immediately left the country. Wow. I I think Iran succeeded in its goal, which was not to send an assault, but to send a message, a message that they can get through, a message that they can use drones as decoys, as pawns to make the Israelis waste a billion three uh, in, in 12 hours. I want to play you something that'll get a little bit under your skin, but it's so absurd, it's, it's almost humorous. Uh, David Cameron, the British uh, foreign minister, former prime minister, answering uh, some questions from a uh, British uh, a television uh, anchor. Chris, play both, both of them. Watch the difference between the first question and his answer and the follow-up and his mm, answer he didn't want to give. What about Iran's frustration at part of its sovereign territory being flattened? Well, I would argue there is a a massive degree of difference between what Israel did in Damascus and, as I said, 301 weapons being launched by the state of Iran at the state of Israel. For the first time, a state-on-state attack, 101 ballistic missiles, 36 cruise missiles, 185 drones. That is a degree of difference. And I think a reckless and dangerous thing for Iran to have done. And I think the whole world can see all these countries that have somehow wondered, well, you know, what is the true nature of Iran? It's there in black and white. What would Britain do if a hostile nation flattened one of our consulates? Well, we would take, you know, we would take the very strong action. And Iran would say that that's what they did? Well, what they did, as I said, was a massive attack. So they were right to respond, but they overreacted, is that what you're saying? What I'm saying is that the 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 attack they carried out was on a very large scale, much bigger than people accepted. they have a right to respond? Well, countries have a right to respond. This is just propaganda poorly, poorly manifested, ludicrously manifested. Yeah. I mean, and credit to the interviewer, um, David Cameron said, we would respond massively. Right. However, Iran can't respond massively. They're, 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 it was too massive. Right. Even though they actually didn't kill anyone. Um, but maybe, maybe they could have. And he downplays what Israel did. What Israel did was unprecedented. I mean, directly striking another country's sovereign territory. He claimed that what Iran did was for the first time a nation-to-nation attack. No, what Israel did was strike the sovereign diplomatic territory of Iran and made this attack inevitable. Uh, And Britain could have played a a role in preventing the Iranian counterattack or reducing its severity by going to the UN and condemning what Israel did. But instead, as the Iranian UN ambassador pointed out, the day after Iran's counterattack, France, the U.S., and Britain went to the U.N. and blocked the condemnation, which is what required Iran to do that in order to deter further Israeli aggression because the quote-unquote international community won't do anything. So it's all David Cameron's fault. It speaks to the colonial, traditional colonial relationship the U.K. has with Iran, where it toppled the Iranian government of Mohammad Mossadegh in 1953 and paved way for this entire crisis that we're witnessing now. Uh, David Cameron cannot get out of that colonial mindset. And what is he doing in as foreign secretary after the disaster that he caused in Libya, where the parliamentary commission in London found that David Cameron completely lied to the public 
in order to justify this attack that destabilized an entire region. He's back there. What a meritocracy. I mean, they just reward the ultimate failures there. Here is another clip of another member of the British Parliament, decidedly different. I'm not even going to tell you who it is. You'll know in a heartbeat. So, Speaker, I knew your father well for a very long time. He was a fine man, and I am sincerely sorry for your loss. There was not one single word in the Prime Minister's statement of condemnation of the Israeli destruction of the Iranian consulate in Damascus, which is the proximate reason for the event everyone is here in concert condemning. He was not even asked to do so by the front bench opposite. Kay Burley is the only person so far to demand that of a government minister. We have no treaty with Israel, at least not one that Parliament has been shown. And the Iranians are not likely to listen to him when Britain occupied Iran, looted its wealth, and overthrew its one democratic socialist government in my own lifetime. <laughs> Well, Mr. Mr. Speaker, what, whatever may have happened uh, a few weeks ago, it is absolutely no justification for launching more than 300 drones and missiles from one sovereign state towards Israel. It's as simple as that. And in the Honourable Gentleman's question, not once did he condemn that action or indeed the actions of Hamas in the region. There is no equivalence between these things whatsoever, and to suggest otherwise is simply wrong. Well, at least they're debating and challenging each other, unlike on the floor, unlike in the American government, where Tony Blinken just signs a document and the stuff goes over to. Uh, goes over to Israel. But it's interesting, I thought, that uh, Rishi Sunak was mouthing the same talking points that David Cameron was. Well, can you imagine Joe Biden surviving question oh, hour? I, oh. <laughs> I mean... Let Thomas I, Massey at him. <laughs> I mean, I, I can't think of any... I, honestly, uh, and I'm not saying this because I'm pro-Trump, I, I think Trump is one of the only presidents in recent times, maybe going back to Bill Clinton. Trump and Bill Clinton might be the only presidents who could have survived question hour. Yes. I mean, o Obama without his teleprompters, it would have been a disaster. Yes. Um, so, you know, it's refreshing to see that George Galloway with his newly founded Workers' Party is really the voice of opposition to this reckless transatlantic regime. He's seated there next in the back bench next to Jeremy Corbyn, who's... Uh, bid for the prime minister was destroyed by the Israel lobby in the UK. And Galloway is just exposing the contradictions of a government that made this attack, this counterattack by Iran inevitable, and which just refuses to pull the plug on this disastrous Israeli assault. And it's, it speaks to the wider mentality that is being shattered right now that has prevailed in Washington, London, and Brussels, which is that they can continuously sanction, sabotage, and even attack all of the official designated enemy nations, whether it's Venezuela, Iran, or Russia, and that those nations have to be the adults in the room and just sit there and take it, right. even though no one's doing anything to stop the, the uh, ferocity of these assaults in these multilateral institutions. And when Russia was surrounded by NATO and the US was piling uh, military materiel on the border of Russia and Ukraine, reality came crashing through on February 23rd, 2022, when the Russian military invaded Ukraine and said, no, you can't move NATO to our borders. It's not happening. We're not going to be the adults in the room anymore. We're actually going to take care of our own national security, as you would have if we had put tons of artillery units on the Mexican U.S.-Mexico border. October 7th, 
Hamas did the same thing. You have been besieging us for 20 years. You're tr the U.S. is trying to go over our heads and put us in the icebox of history by normalizing, pushing normalization between the Arab powers and Israel. And we're not going to let that happen. Reality came crashing through. And then reality came crashing through again. After First, after Soleimani was assassinated by the U.S., Al-Assad base came under attack in Iraq, Iraq. And now reality is crashing through in an even bigger way with Iran pumping tons and tons of metal into Israel to tell them you just can't play by these same old rules. So the, the whole calculus has changed because the geopolitical power balance has changed. And this is the dawn of the multipolar world order. I want to talk to you uh, before we finish, Max, about threats to the freedom of speech in the United States. Uh, yesterday, the president of Columbia University was grilled by one of the House committees. Today, she had police. I don't know if they're New York City police or if they're Columbia University police arresting protesters that silently pitched pup tents on the main lawn in front of the uh, library. And yesterday, I never heard of this gentleman before, Representative Anthony Desposito, a Republican from New York, actually introduced legislation condemning certain words. Listen to this. My resolution condemns the slogan from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free because it is blatantly anti-Semitic. Madam Speaker, I remind my colleagues that this slogan was used by Iranian leaders responsible for the recent attacks on Israel. This slogan communicates one thing and one thing only. It is not human rights. It is certainly not peace. It is the violent destruction of the state of Israel and the Jewish people that live within it. To employ this slogan is to perpetuate the cause of hate and regional instability. Between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea sits Israel, a free, diverse nation, a safe haven, for Jewish people, formed in the wake of the mass murder of European Jews. When the world witnessed the tragedies of the Holocaust, we said, never again. Now is our chance to mean it and to reject anti-Semitic hate in all of its forms, whenever and wherever it rears its ugly head. I guess he forgot his oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution, which includes, of course, the First Amendment. I'll let you take it from there. Well, who, I mean, who is this guy? He's a, some, he's a former cop who found his way into Congress, and AIPAC wrote that speech for him. Mm -hmm. AIPAC wrote the legislation, and he's just being put up as the mouthpiece, and he's going to get legal bribery as a reward. They're just going to pump more money into his next campaign. That's what, that's how Congress functions. So what we're witnessing, whether it's there in Congress, where members of Congress, like Tom Cotton, who said we should bounce the rubble on Gaza, uh, other members of Congress who said all Palestinians should be killed, none of them are being censored like Rashida Tlaib was. N there's no legislation opposing the uh, you know slogans calling for the genocide of Palestinians. The hypocrisy is just off the charts, whether it's there or Columbia University, where three students were just suspended for protesting after Columbia University's president was hauled before Congress and forced to basically pander to them and condemn her own faculty, especially Palestinian professors like Joseph Mossad. Three students were just suspended for protesting. It's like unheard of. There have been much more ferocious protests where nothing happened. One of them happens to be Ilhan Omar's daughter, by the way. Mm. Um you have professors at CUNY like Danny Shaw, who's a friend of the Gray Zone. He was uh, he was fired uh, after a decision to not fire him for his views opposing the genocide in Palestine. Jody Dean at Smith College just suspended or if not fired for a column she wrote on the Verso webpage, uh, basically for speech crimes. And then you have this valedictorian at USC who is a student focused on human rights and opposing genocide, who's Muslim, who is being blocked from speaking at her school's commencement ceremony because they know what she's going to say. She's going to condemn the genocide 
in Gaza. So what we have right here, they're using the arguments actually of the left. These mostly right-wing and pro-Israel elements are using the arguments and rhetorical techniques of the left. They're saying that these professors and these students, including this valedictorian, threaten the safety mm. of Jewish students. They're using woke politics mm. as a smokescreen for the reality that the Zionist millionaire and billionaire class that is footing the bills for a lot of these colleges who these presidents rely on is seeking to shred the First Amendment on behalf of a foreign apartheid state carrying out a genocide in real time. And it really doesn't matter what you think about Israel at this point, on, the, on this point, or what you think about Palestine, or whether you are annoyed by the protesters blocking traffic. This is about the First Amendment. This is about the thing that makes America special. Should people be allowed, be criminalized for saying things that you find hateful or disagreeable? And if you think that, you really don't believe in the concept of democracy. And I want to say that I, I think I've been pretty consistent in defending uh, people who I find disagreeable's right to say things, including online. Uh, and the right claims that they oppose you know, the online censorship machine. They claim they oppose cancel culture. But when it comes to Ben Shapiro's feelings and his ethno-religious, fra fragile ethno-religious identity, what well, turns out the First Amendment and the facts don't matter. So we need to say, forget about Israel-Palestine. This is about the First Amendment. Right. And the Israel lobby is presenting one of the most dire existential threats to it of, of our lifetime. Mike uh, Johnson, the... Uh... Uh, speaker that Rand Paul was on with us this morning. He ripped, ripped into Mike Johnson, but uh, he just announced in order to gain more Republican votes for the money for Israel and the money for Ukraine, they're going to add a section to this legislation um, requiring TikTok to be sold. More assaults on the First Amendment. These people just don't care about the Constitution. No, and they they make everyone feel voiceless. I mean, TikTok is where so many Gen Zers are finding a voice. Right. And that's why they're out there protesting. They're so angry and why they're not supporting the two-party system anymore. They see Palestinians as sort of a symbol of powerlessness, statelessness, voicelessness, a symbol of their own sense of political disenfranchisement in this country. And those protests are only going to grow in ferocity. And I think Republicans and people who are part of America First are beginning to see the hypocrisy and contradictions too in the leadership of the Republican Party, especially Mike Johnson. I mean, here's a guy who kind of comes from nowhere and comes from Kentucky and Jake Sullivan, the national security chief of the Biden administration, takes him into a private meeting on February 15th. Jake Sullivan from Yale, who ran Hillary Clinton's campaign, who has every credential in the book in his 40s. And he impresses Mike Johnson and makes him feel important in Washington. And then he warns him, he literally warns him that Russia is creating a dangerous space laser program. He mm -hmm. scolds Mike Johnson about Russian space lasers and says, you know, they have a space weapon, a secret space weapon. And you're one of the only lawmakers to get this top secret briefing, Mike Johnson. Are you going to be Chamberlain or are you going to be Churchill? Yes. And Johnson comes out of that meeting and he's so he, he feels like history rests on his shoulders suddenly. And he's now saying it. He says, yeah. I want to be like Churchill. I am a war, pol a war legislator. Yeah. He said, I am. I'm a wartime speaker. Here's a guy when he was just a congressman voted against the extensions of FISA. But when, um, progressives and libertarians offered an amendment to section 702 that permits the warrantless spying on foreigners and the Americans with whom they speak. The amendment would just have required a search warrant. What a novel idea, a search warrant. The vote in the house was 212 in favor to 212 against. Johnson was presiding. He left the speaker's chair to come down into the well of the house to vote against it. Well, this is, this is, this is freedom. This is, Freedom isn't free, I guess. Yeah. And neither is the $8 billion that we, thanks to Mike Johnson, in coalition with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the $8 billion that the American taxpayer will be paying 
as part of this supplemental to Ukrainian public workers and paying for Ukrainian pensions and to keep the Zelensky regime afloat as he sends younger and younger Ukrainian men to die in a fruitless and hopeless war. That's what we're paying for. Yes. Max, thank you very much, my dear friend. Great, great analysis on, on both of these uh, unfortunate fronts. But I hope you'll come back uh, and visit us again next week. Looking forward to it. Thanks as always. Thank you. Tomorrow, of course, uh, we have our usual Friday afternoon for you. And by the way, let, let me thank Max again for his just courageous, and I've used this word before, but only on very few people, encyclopedic knowledge uh, of the history of the events that he's talking about. At 2 o'clock Friday afternoon, Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson, and at 3 o'clock, the boys, the, round table, the intelligence roundtable, Larry Johnson and Ray McGovern, to finish our week with you. Thank you for watching, my dear friends. Judge Napolitano for Judging Freedom.